Hello and welcome to this episode of CEO Roundtable Bridging Asia podcast. This is David Kim. I'm founder and CEO of North Head Capital, senator at World Business Angels Investment Forum. I'm also CEO coach and entrepreneurship lecturer. In this podcast, I'm interviewing the entrepreneur and business owners of rising startups and SMEs around the world, and introducing their interesting world story and their tactical advices. I hope you enjoy. Today's guest is Dr. William Mapa. He is a founder and the chief executive of South African startup Bula Mobile, the app that links primary healthcare workers in remote rural areas in Africa with medical and surgical specialists in hospitals. He's eyeing what it describes as the huge potential of the global mobile healthcare market. Bula Mobiles allow the healthcare workers to capture basic patient information, take the photographs. Do a basic test and capture a brief medical history before sending it directly to a specialist. They can ask for advice over the dedicated messaging platform and decide on the best course of care for the patient. Uh, Dr. William, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much. How did you get into the idea to start the Vula Mobile? So Vula Mobile is named after the Vula Mechlo Eye Clinic, which is in Swaziland. And I was working there and there was only one eye clinic for the whole country. And we used to drive four hours uh, at a time to go and do outreach across the country. And when we got to many of the rural places, we realized that the community health workers had really good mobile phones. In fact, they had better mobile phones than the, than the doctors. partly because mobile phones were seen as a status symbol in many communities. And then we realized that why were we driving four hours each time uh, when the community healthcare workers could have been sending pictures and communicating with us uh, remotely. And I think especially in, in rural areas that would save so much more time and effort for transport for the patients, for work between the health workers and the specialists. So that's where we first had the idea for, for Vula Mobile. Um, so Vula means open, uh, Vula Metal means open your eyes. So uh, I guess our eyes were opened uh, to the potential for new technology uh, in Swaziland. Uh, how many users do you have on the app and the number of primary healthcare workers and the specialists and the, what is the penetration of your of Vula Mobile app at the moment? Sure. So what was interesting is that um, we started off with one specialty, which is ophthalmology, and mostly nurses connecting to the specialists. Uh, it's grown to now over 80 different types of health worker. Uh, so health worker can range from an ambulance assistant uh, to a dietitian, to a physio, to a pharmacist. Um, and there are now 53 different specialties using Vula, um, ranging from cardiology, dermatology, Um, a bunch of free COVID uh, testing services as well, thanks to the new pandemic. And so, yeah, we've really grown beyond our initial scope. Um, it's been an exciting uh, journey. And they're now over almost 16,000 users in South Africa uh, on Vula Mobile. Yeah, that's amazing. That's huge. Yeah, I think if you look at um, the numbers of health workers in South Africa, Uh, we are very close to having about uh, a third of all the doctors in South Africa uh, on Vula um, and you know, many other health workers as well. I can imagine, I mean, in order to connect primary health care workers with a specialist, uh, I can imagine app. I haven't used that app yet, but I can imagine it has a messenger and chatting function and then sending, sending the image to each other. So, uh, I mean, what is the great things about the Vula app? So people like Vula for different reasons, depending on who they are. So if you can imagine that you're a primary healthcare worker, in the past, you would spend literally hours on the phone trying to speak to a specialist, trying to get advice. It's impossible to connect uh, both health workers and specialists both at the same time. Uh, often that's very difficult because both sets of people are, are, are working. So the primary healthcare workers love Vula because suddenly they can actually communicate asynchronously with, spe with specialists. And in about 30% of cases, they're able to help their patients with advice from the specialists, which means that they're learning case by case and offering better services um, themselves. 
the specialists like using Vula because in the past, many people who did not need to see a specialist would come in uh, to their clinics because they didn't know uh, better and the primary healthcare workers weren't sure. So now the number of referrals to uh, their physical referrals to their centers has decreased by about 30%, which means that more people who actually need specialist care are getting specialist care faster. And then the administrators, the health administrators love Vula because suddenly for the first time, they get to see the flow of patients um, between health workers, between facilities. And this is connecting people who don't know each other. So there are many health record systems in hospitals and clinics or teams that use different software whereby they can connect with people that they know. Uh, but Vula is um, one of the few systems that connects people who don't know each other. Um, so there's the three different uh, groups that like Vula um, a lot. And then gradually more now we're actually getting researchers using Vula who are looking at uh, ways of improving the systems overall uh, using collated data. And they're also looking to use that for machine learning and um, new techniques that will help improve the system over time. So it's been interesting to see how it's used by different people in different ways and the different groups uh, benefit in different ways. Sounds like uh, a Vula app, Vula Mobile is more like an open collaboration system compared to the other the commercial uh, comparable software app, right? Yeah, that's correct. It's, it's, I mean, it's quite funny that our name, uh, you know, means open. So right. kind of in, uh, it kind of represents who we are. And uh, if you look at the, the, the logo of the app, it looks like um, beads that have been sewn together by thread, which is the sort of common symbol in our country. Um, so it's connecting different types and different uh, groups of people. Um, yeah, I like your description of the open collaboration. Uh, do you have competitors? So it depends on the uh, sector of the market that you're looking at uh, in terms of competitors. So we actually regard um, uh, traditional referral systems that used to be on fax or email, um, sometimes using hospital bleepers. In a way, those are some of our competitors because that's often what people are replacing uh, when they use Vula. Uh, a common system for communicating between health workers um, has also been WhatsApp, which is owned by Facebook. Yes. And people regard Vula as a more secure means of medical communication. So that's another thing that uh, the users replace when they start using Vula. Um, globally, if you look at um, chatting, medical chat systems uh, between health workers uh, who know each other, like in Teams, there are many, ranging from Microsoft Teams to, to Slack. There's one called Forward in the um, United Kingdom. Uh, there's Tiger Text in the in the US. Um, so yeah, there are many uh, people who do parts of what we do. Uh, we've very specialized in that the referral system, um, connecting groups that don't know each other. So I think we do have a, an advantage at the moment. Um, I think one of our advantages also stemmed from our origin, uh, where we made Vula free to use, and no one was paid to use it. It was never part of a pilot project, and so. If it wasn't used, uh, we would need to change it. So we learned a lot uh, kind of growing up. Um, and I think it was in a way that was an advantage um, and especially being developed in uh, a poor resource setting where we weren't really sure whether whether, whether people actually have data to, to use it in the first place. Uh, we did a lot of work on data optimization. So it uses about 20 times less data than WhatsApp, uh, which means that it can be used in the, the rural areas where I used to work. Um, so yeah, it's been an interesting um, journey, replacing old systems, uh, encountering uh, common messaging systems, um, and now starting to compete with other companies. Yeah, so you are competing with the legacy system then, mostly? Yes, there are so many legacy systems in healthcare. And I think what's happened uh, this year is that the demand and the desire for digital healthcare products has really been increased. Um, COVID's revealed the fact that it's absolutely necessary. It's not a choice anymore. Uh, so yeah. I think um, the networking that's happened within the last six months and the partnerships that we formed um, have all yeah, been an amazing journey. Right? So we can start replacing uh, all the legacy systems. Uh, I understand you launched the app uh, in 
2014, I can easily imagine how much of healthcare issues Vula has uh, solved so far and made an impact and how Vula can potentially reshape the, the ecosystem further. What are the biggest challenges in growing your business? So I think we've had different challenges at uh, different stages. Uh, I think at the beginning, it seemed very, very new to people. Uh, people weren't used to doing electronic referrals. So at the beginning, it very much was more sort of change, um, behavior change, and managing different groups of, of people. Uh, the next challenge um, was finding a good team to work with. And the following change was actually raising um, uh, funding to uh, improve that team and to grow the team. Uh, so we've you know, been through different stages of different challenges. And then our current challenge is how do we scale this as fast as possible, uh, both in Africa and uh, outside our continent. Um, so we just had our first contract in the United Kingdom, uh, which was uh, completed last week. And yeah, we're looking forward to hopefully through this podcast reaching people in the, um, in the Eastern continents. Uh, how do Vula Mobile generate the revenue and who are the paying customer? So initially it was built to solve a problem, uh, which was an interesting way to start a business here. So I wasn't sure how it was going to generate revenue uh, initially. Uh, however, we got our first, uh, what we call an interaction contract with uh, Sanofi, which is a French pharmaceutical company. Uh, we won their Africa Tech Prize at the Viva Technology Conference in 2018. And that led to a partnership where they support the growth of three specialties on Vula, which is psychiatry, tuberculosis, and endocrinology. And in exchange, they do get very targeted advertising space uh, on our system. Uh, if you can imagine, if you ad put an advert on Facebook um, for a certain endocrinology product, you will only reach the doctors when they're at home and relaxing. Whereas with our system, you're reaching endocrinologists while they're at work, while they're treating patients, uh, because they're getting the information they need on the adverts, uh, rather than just um, seeing or having to find all information themselves. So it's very targeted and they, they like that. So we signed a four-year contract with um, Sanofi. Uh, also in 2018, we signed our first uh, government tender. So there are nine provinces in South Africa. Uh, we've got our first uh, tender in 2018 as well. And we're now working towards a, a national contract for all the provinces at the same time. Uh, so yeah, we've had a lot of support from both commercial companies and from um, uh, the national government. And then increasingly we're working towards more commercial products now in line with sort of more common telemedicine offerings, uh, which we call our virtual clinic. Um, and that's connecting members of the public to, to services as well. So I think what's happened now is that our level of scale has uh, opened up commercial uh, revenue streams that we didn't have two years ago. Uh, so it so, sounds very familiar, like something like similar to the story of Amazon.com. I remember the founder of Amazon.com, he mentioned that the early day, he, think, he thought that his business model is like not for profit, right? But the ones uh, he uh, build up the build and grow the platform, and become dominant, uh, uh, I mean, player in the ecosystem, then he can do everything, right? Going forward, yeah. Yeah, it's a very good. I mean, I'm I'm not pretending we are Amazon yet, um, <laughs> but it's a very very good analogy that at the beginning you're solving a problem, um, right? And then I think in healthcare, if you deliver value, uh, the money will follow. Yes, um, you're perhaps right. Perhaps that's a better way of doing things than trying to create a commercial product from the very beginning where you might not be solving a, a big problem. Right. So I think we were, um, yeah, we're fortunate to go through that journey in that direction. It should not chase the money, right? Money will chase you someday. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that's <laughs> I think uh, uh, like that. Yeah, yeah. Rule, rule of the world and rule of the game, I guess. Yeah. Is there any upside or commercial incentive to primary healthcare workers or specialists and the app? Uh, so there was no commercial, like direct commercial incentive. So typically in, in South Africa, where we started, it was started in the public healthcare sector. The 
the healthcare sector in South Africa has two overlapping sections. One is the private sector, which is very much a uh, fee for service. In the public sector, all the health workers are salaried employees. So if you're a nurse working at a clinic, you have a salary to work there every day. And if you're a salaried specialist at a tertiary hospital, it's your job as part of a team to be on call and rotation for those specialties. Um, so there was no direct financial incentive in the public sector. All you're doing is you're making the existing systems way more efficient uh, by converting old legacy systems to a more modern technique uh, like Vrula for managing uh, referrals. Um, however, what we've realized as we've grown is that there is actually a demand for a fee-for-service telemedicine type solution. And the one thing that we've got now is the network of specialists, which is quite unique. Uh, there are many telemedicine services that offer um, primary health care, uh, so instant access to a nurse or to a doctor. Uh, but the missing part in many projects is, or many businesses is the link to a specialist. So what happens if the GP can't diagnose your skin condition or can't diagnose your heart condition or doesn't know enough about ophthalmology and eye care to help the patient? What happens then? And we've realized that that's a key role that we can play um, because we've got that network of specialists already. Uh, so although we didn't focus on uh, direct financial benefit to doctors initially, uh, that is becoming an option now. What is next for the Vula Mobile? How do you want to change the world and long-term vision and any uh, expansion plan? Yes, I mean, um, my, my real passion is improving healthcare. Um, so I guess we started small. I mean, Swaziland is a tiny country with only a million people. Uh, now we're in South Africa uh, with almost 60 million people. Uh, there are a lot more people in the world, and we really want to see us working in multi-languages, uh, different situations, and different countries. Uh, so we're really excited about um, international growth. Uh, and we've got an American investor, as well as a Pan-African investor as well. Um, so looking forward to expanding. And we're yeah, very keen to come to uh, countries like China and India, um, Australia, and Japan. We really hope to, and especially Korea. I've got a a great love for Korean movies. Uh, so we yeah. hope to um, be in those countries uh, soon. Yes. Uh, this week we'll have our 333,333rd patients, so a third of a million uh, patients uh, so far. That'll, that'll happen this week. Uh, we really want to reach uh, a million patients uh, next year. Do you have any fundraising plan to scale up the business? I understand that you raised a bit of equity funding recently. Did they ask yes. you about your exit plan? Uh, so, you know, my passion is definitely... I guess they ask a discussion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I think we were very lucky because we actually started a equity raise before COVID. Um, right. And then I guess the healthcare sector has become more valuable during COVID. So we closed that round. Uh, we raised a million dollars, which um, when you convert into our local currency, which is RANDs, uh, it means a lot. So raising money overseas and bringing it in uh, is a huge advantage uh, for us. We'll probably raise again uh, next year to, because this, this fundraise was to fast track the, the revenue creation. Uh, the next fundraise will be for you know, multinational growth, um, probably mid next year, uh, maybe the end of next year. Um, so yeah, that's, that's going to be an exciting part. And then I think in terms of an exit, um, personally, I mean, there are other health interventions that I'd like to, to bring to the world. And so at some stage, um, I'm, I'm predicting that I have a partial exit and a uh, step away I help the company continue to grow, but then focus on new initiatives uh, myself. I see. So, uh, trade sales, IPO? Oh, uh, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> that yeah. would be um, a great exit. Um, yeah. So, yeah, hopefully one day an IPO, that would be fantastic. Right. In fact, this is a popular question for, from the institutional investor because in many cases, uh, founders are so fascinated, excited about the growth but uh, they don't have time or they don't have experience in the, uh, I mean, planning and structuring exit plan in advance. Uh, that's why. Yes, that... I mean, I, 
yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, I trained as a as a medical doctor. Um, I did have some media experience uh, as well, as well as some experience in uh, mobile applications for healthcare. Uh, but starting this uh, business, I didn't have a whole lot of financial uh, skills. Mm -hmm. um, but very fortunate to have brought on um, a chief uh, financial officer and a chief commercial officer, both of whom have been uh, part of big companies before and built small companies into large companies. So it's been very exciting for me to have a team that does think like that and to encourage me to think beyond just the, the medical side of the, the business. So I've learned a lot about uh, finance from them. Um, and it's great to have a team that has a variety of skills um, so that we complement each other. I'm excited about, uh, I mean, huge social impact and disruption Vula can potentially bring over going forward. Then my question is why we don't see the Vula mobile everywhere in the world? Is it because of regulatory issues in every country? Then how come it, is it possible to have Vula Mobile in South Africa and other part of the Africa? So good question. So I think um, the reason you don't see it everywhere yet, I mean, one is that, uh, you know, we are growing now. I mean, last year we only had three employees. Uh, the year before that we had one. And now we've got 14 employees with a strong mix of skills in the team and uh, you know, anyone listening to this, we would love to work with to expand Vula into your into your area. Uh, if you look at um, why doesn't this exist in other places in its current form, it's because uh, referrals uh, aren't typically seen as a financially lucrative uh, part of healthcare. If you go to any telemedicine service, it's a free for, it's a fee for service. If you go to hospital, it's a typically a fee for service or someone has paid for you to, to be there. Uh, the links between health workers um, is hard to commercialize until you get to scale. So I think we were lucky and we worked very hard to make sure that we could solve that problem. And that's a really difficult problem to solve. If you speak to anyone in healthcare and you ask about referrals, they'll probably roll their eyes and say, I wish we had a solution. And yeah, we spent six years building that solution. Um, so I think it's not typically where the money is. And I think maybe that's why people haven't focused on it uh, primarily. Any potential that your business may expand to into Asia or the collaboration possibility with the Asian partners? Yes, I mean, that would be a, a dream come true for me. Uh, so we'd love to partner with uh, Asian countries and very keen to, in the next round, to involve uh, an Asian investor or two. I think that would be a, a really good um, strategy for us. Thank you so much for the joining the show today. I really enjoyed the conversation, your interesting story. Hope to catch up with you again. And when you have more interest, more story and great success to share with us.